Hey guys, today I want to take a look at sequences and series and their convergence or divergence. And one of the things I wanted to let let you guys know, it's, it's easy to get lost in all these uh, convergence tests and stuff, especially if you don't know why we're doing it. So it's important to keep in mind that our goal ultimately here is to sort of cheat the system and say, well, transcendental functions like e to the x, ln, sine, cosine, these functions that by definition can't be written as polynomials, uh, we're going to say, uh, yeah, they can, but they're just infinitely long. Now, in order to be able to do that, we need to have a handle on infinitely long sums of terms, right, because they're infinitely long polynomials. We also need to have a handle on where and when they're gonna actually give us an appropriate answer, or give us the correct answer, whether they're just gonna blow up to infinity and not be useful at all. Okay, so that's sort of what's the background or the overarching goal of what we're trying to do here is to develop another tool, another way of looking at transcendental functions. So let's go way back and start at the beginning. What's a set? A set is a collection of objects, a collection of objects, okay? With a set, we're not concerned about their order. Sets are usually denoted with curly brackets like this. And so say the set one, two, three, that's the same as the set uh, three, two, one. The same three objects. With, if I put three marbles in a bag and they shake around, it's the same three marbles, right? I, I don't care about their order. Okay, so that's a set. A sequence. A sequence is an ordered set where each element in the set is given a name. Okay, the name is an index, so uh, we can call up by the position, okay? So usually a sequence will be written a sub n, set a sub n, where n is that index. It's just a counter where we're giving a name to the particular element in the set. Right? And we're saying, okay, well, this is the first element or the second element or the third element, in which case these would be two completely different sequences, right? They're the same set, but if we look, do concern about their order and we say, okay, we're going to name this one the first one, the second one, the third one, these are different sequences, okay? So formally, a sequence is a function from the natural numbers that's mainly it. For us, we'll be looking primarily into the reals, right? So we're taking as inputs whole counting numbers and saying, what's the first term? We might use zeros, you know, um, it's not strictly speaking a natural number, but it just depends on where you want to start counting. Um, okay, so formally sequences are functions from natural numbers into the real numbers, uh, but we really just look at it as an ordered set. Okay, so that's sort of the fundamental definitions of what a set is and what a sequence is. An ordered set. A set's just a collection of objects without regard to order. Now, we want to define what it means for a sequence to converge. So a sequence converges Converges means that the limit as n goes to infinity of my sequence a sub n is L. Now, if we had more time or if we were in a proper classroom setting and we go through the actual formal epsilon proofs and do all that stuff, we did do it um, in our extra, but for now we'll just leave it as that. What we're saying is that as we go along in the long run, right, the limit exists and it is some finite number L, 
This is a double statement here. That limit exists and it is some finite L. So there are two ways that otherwise it diverges, right? Let me say that. Otherwise, uh, the sequence diverges. Right? In which, if the sequence diverges, that means that the limit either doesn't exist, maybe it oscillates back and forth between some two values or something, or more or maybe it blows up to positive infinity or negative infinity, in which case it's not some finite number, okay? So a sequence can diverge if the limit fails to exist or if it's not some finite number. If it does exist and it is some finite number, then we say that the sequence converges, that the terms are getting closer and closer and closer to some value, okay? So that's what it means for a sequence to converge uh, let's define monotone. Monotone. Now let's let's say monotone decreasing. A sequence is monotone decreasing if there exists a backward capital E. For those of you guys who haven't seen that, it's a little fluffy, sorry. Backwards capital E is the existential quantifier means that there exists something. So there exists some, let's call it capital N, in the natural numbers, in N, such that if N, our index, our counter on our uh, sequence, is greater than that capital N, then a sub n plus 1, that is to say that the next term in the sequence is less than or equal to the current term. All right, so it may be that the sequence is doing some crazy blah, 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 but then there exists some number forevermore, those terms are either getting less or staying the same. They're non-increasing, in other words. That's monotone decreasing. On the reverse side, of course, there's monotone increasing. Monotone increasing. Just the reverse, there's some number so that forevermore, the next term, a sub n plus one, is greater than or equal to a sub n. Okay, so in other words, it's non-decreasing. Can stay the same or stay the same for a while and then uh, keep going on. That's okay, just as long as it's not reversing. Okay, so that's what it means to be monotone. Just saying it has a continuous behavior after a certain, so, so after a certain point. Now bounded, say a sequence is bounded, let's say bounded above first, oops, above, if there exists, uh, let's make it a capital M, an M in N, such that For all n, a sub n is less than or equal to m. Okay? This is bounded above. So we're saying, okay, maybe maybe this sequence does all kinds of stuff. Who knows? It might, might do, 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 who knows, whatever. But for all n, there exists some m in the natural numbers, some integer, positive integer, that's always greater than all of those terms. The greater than or equal to is fine, but usually we can find one that's greater. Then we say that that sequence is bounded above. Likewise, on the other side, bounded below, similar sort of idea. We just need to reverse that. Bounded below, 
Well, it's still the existence of this number, but now we need for all n, a sub n is greater than or equal to that m. They're all above that number, yeah? So that in which case it's bounded below. All our sequence terms are above that m. Okay, and a sequence is uh, bounded, bounded, if it's bounded above and bounded below. Okay? Then we get lazy. If it's bounded both above and below, we get lazy and we just say it's bounded. The sequence is bounded. Now to the punchline, all those definitions and what's going on to the punchline. There's a theorem, a really important theorem. It says this. In general, a bounded monotone, monotone sequence, sequence, Converges. That's the punchline. A monotone, a bounded monotone sequence converges. Now you can split that. That's more in general. We can say, well, if it's monotone increasing and bounded above, right? I'm adding, or I'm, I've got an infinite number of terms in my sequence, so I've got just more and more and more and more and more in terms, they're always going up or staying equal at least, but they don't ever get above some height. I've got infinitely many of these terms that are always getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger or at least staying equal, then they have to be convergent. And likewise on the bottom side, if I have a monotone decreasing sequence, so I have infinitely many terms that are either going down, they're not increasing, right? They're either staying equal or going down and I have some number below that it never goes below, the only way I can have infinitely many things going down, 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 and never crossing some boundary is if they converge. Okay, so that's kind of the punchline. Um, monotone increasing and bounded above that converges. Monotone increasing and bounded above, it converges. And likewise, monotone, monotone decreasing, decreasing and bounded below. In either of these two cases, for sure, that sequence converges. All right, so for example, something like the sequence one over n, right? The sequence one over n, I said, well, does this sequence converge or not? Well, I know for all n, for all n, one over n is greater than zero. For all n, right? It's all, they're all positive numbers. So I know that one over n is bounded below by zero. For all n, there exists this m in the natural numbers. Well, that's not really natural. It's an integer, but okay. There exists this number that all those terms are above. Now I just need to show that it's monotone decreasing, and I'm done. We got that it converges. Okay, so I need to show that a sub n is less than or equal to a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n. Okay, well, let's, what's the n plus 1th term? It's just 1 over n plus 1. I want to show that that's less than or equal to the nth term, 1 over n. So right now, this is what I want. And I'm just going to do a little algebra and see if I get something that's true. If I get something that's true, then I can just reverse my argument. So let's see. Uh, n is less than or equal to n plus 1. Subtract n. 0 is less than or equal to 1. I would say that that's true. <laughs> zero is less than one. So we're good to go. 
to actually prove that it's monotone decreasing, I'd start here and work my way backward, right? That shows that a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n. Start with something we know to be true and work my way back. Okay, so this shows that it's monotone, monotone decreasing. This showed that it was bounded below. So we have a monotone decreasing sequence that's bounded below. Therefore, you can conclude, therefore, or three little dots is therefore, that sequence, ooh, that was bad, oh, oh, one over n uh, converges. Now, it doesn't necessarily tell us what it converges to, but we know that it does converge. Of course, one over n converges to zero. But... Okay, so that's the boundedness theorem. It's sort of a basic uh, tool that we can use very often to show that a sequence will converge. Sometimes, once we have our basic ones, we'll use those, what we already know about some sequences, um, to get to other ones. But uh, that's mainly what we need for there. Okay, so we defined a set. We defined a sequence. It's an ordered set. We've defined what it means for a sequence to converge, that the limit as n goes to infinity is some finite number, L. Uh, we've defined monotone increasing and decreasing, bounded, and we got the boundedness theorem that a bounded monotone function uh, sequence converges. Sweet. All right, so let's define a series then. A series is sum of a sequence. Okay, that's it. It's the sum of the sequence. So it's usually written with our sigma notation, capital S, for sum. We have our index here. It tells us where to start. We can start anywhere, really. Uh, a lot of times we start at 1, usually. Now, for us, we're going to be primarily concerned with infinite series, so there's an upper bound there. We may change those things around um, depending on what we're looking at. We might have a finite sum, um, but in general, we're looking at infinite sums. And then we have some sequence A sub n. Okay, so this is a series. We call this a series A sub n. Okay. Now, most of the time, we get lazy and we don't write the infinity. If there is no infinity, then it's implied. We also get very lazy about the curly brackets, concerned about the fact that the sequence is a set, and we just kind of just drop those off and understand that these a sub n's represent terms in a sequence. So, really, this is equivalent to the series n equals 1 a sub n. Right? Very often we'll just leave the infinity off and the curly brackets and, and just write things like this. It's, it's quicker. But it's important to note that those other things are understood in the background. They're still there. Okay? So that is a series. It's simply the sum of a sequence. Now let's define the nth partial sum, the nth partial sum of a series, that's going to be, uh, should probably use a different letter then, uh, it's going to be the sum from i equal 1 to n of a sub i. That's just habit calling it the, the nth partial sum, so I changed my i to in, for index. What this is saying is, start at 1, right? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up to the nth term. Yeah? That's the nth partial sum. 
of a series. Adding up from one to the nth term. So let's say we had, for example, um, the series n equals one, uh, two to the n, for example. Okay, so if I wanted to look at the first partial sum, well, that would just be two to the first, so just two, right? Second partial sum, that's gonna be two to the first plus two squared, which is uh, six. Okay, and so on and so on, right? As we go down. All right. So we've defined a series, it's the sum of a sequence. Define the nth partial sum. Now we are able to define what it means for a series to converge. So what we'll do is we'll look at the sequence of partial sums. You see that this is going to give a sequence. The first partial sum, the second partial sum, the third partial sum, the nth partial sum. We're looking at that sequence and seeing whether it converges to some number. Okay. So what we're looking at is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence of nth partial sums. So in general, what I'm going to want to do is to try to find a formula for that nth partial sum and then take its limit. Okay. If that limit is L, is some, well, let's call it S, then the series, A sub n, is S. We say that is the sum, that the series converges and its sum is equal to that S, the limit of the sequence of partial sums. So it is important to note there, we're using the convergence of a sequence to define the convergence of a series. The sequence that we're using is the sequence of these partial sums. Okay. Good. So that's what it means for a series to converge. Now, one thing that should even be intuitively clear is if I'm going to add up an infinite number of things, right? I'm going to add up an infinite number of things and get a finite answer to get some value, the things that I'm adding up have to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as we go along. If I'm adding up some constant number or anything like that, it's going to just blow up to infinity, right? So the only way that I can have this sequence of terms and adding more and more and more and more, but their sum is getting closer and closer and closer to some value, I got to be adding smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller amounts to it. Okay, so that's, it's not enough, unfortunately, but it's necessary. All right, so we can say it this way. If a series, uh, a sub n, converges, so if we do have a genuinely convergent series, then... The limit as n goes to infinity of the terms of that sequence or of, of the series just looking at the term alone that has to go to zero okay for guarantee those terms have to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller they have to go to zero now unfortunately that's not enough it's necessary, but it's not sufficient, is, is the way to say that. There is a series in particular, the harmonic series, that we'll, we'll talk about more in a minute. Uh, the series 1 over n, n equals 1 to infinity. 
This series diverges. This is called the harmonic series. The harmonic series. It's a really, really important series. It, divi it diverges. So in this case, it's a really, really important counterexample, right? Clearly, we just showed earlier that, well, we didn't show it, but we know it converges to uh, the limit as n goes to infinity, oops, of 1 over n is clearly 0, right? But the series diverges, and we'll prove that in a minute. Okay, so this is a very, very count, uh, important counterexample. The terms do go to a zero, but the series diverges. So going to zero is not enough, but it has to be. So that gives us the divergence test, which is usually the first test that I'll apply to a series, because it's usually a very easy or easier just to take the limit of the terms. So if the limit, oops, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n isn't zero, if it's anything other than zero, then the series a sub n diverges. Okay, now it's important to note that this is not a test for convergence in any way. Taking the limit and having it be equal to zero is not enough. I'm going to need more work to do. But if I take the limit and it's not zero, you know, if I take, if I'm looking at the series uh, 3n squared plus 2 over 4n squared minus 3n plus 1, let's say. Instead of doing any kind of polynomial long division or par fracking or trying to factor this stuff, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this term. Well, all the rest of this junk, I don't care about it, right? In the long run, it's only the 3n squared over 4n squared that matter. They have the same degree. They're, the top is going to infinity as fast as the bottom is going to zero. So they cancel each other out and we get three quarters. But that means in the long run, in the long run, as I'm going off to infinity, I'm essentially... Now, it's not exactly, because this is the limit, but I'm essentially adding three quarters and three quarters and three quarters and three quarters and three quarters, and three quarters oh, or something very near to three quarters, over and over and over and over and over. This, of course, just will blow up, right? It'll diverge. So this is not zero. That implies that the series, the series diverges. No extra work necessary, right? Just take that limit. If it's not zero, I'm done. That thing diverges. All right. So that's the divergence test. And one more time, it's important to know that this tells you nothing about convergence. It's only a test for divergence. Okay. Good. So we've got... The divergence test. Quick and easy way to tell at least that much. Let's look at some of the, well, some of the basic forms, or let's start with a, a basic form. Thing that we can get a handle on and know something about and then use to get out other functions. In particular, I'm talking about a geometric, geometric. Geometric series is a series of a form, series, n equals zero. Now it is important that our index starts at zero for these. n equals zero, a, r to the n. A series of this form is called a geometric series. Now this a is the first term. Right, because when n is zero, this will be one, and I'll just have a. So a is my first term, and r is a common ratio. Common ratio between the terms in that sequence. Okay. 
This geometric series will converge for the absolute value of r less than 1, strictly less than 1. Okay, we'll, I'll show you this in a second, why that is, we'll prove it. Um, clearly, if, if r is equal to 1, then 1 to any power is just 1, and I get a. Right? So I'll be adding a plus a plus a plus a plus a plus a plus a forever. So that'll clearly diverge. So we can see that already. r equals 1 diverges. But in fact, it's also true if the absolute value of r is greater than 1, it diverges. Okay, so strictly speaking, we could just say absolute value of r greater than or equal to 1, that diverges. All right, so let's prove that. Let's show how that works and, and uh, what's going on there. So I have this series, series a r to the n, right? n equals zero. And I'm trying to develop a formula for the nth partial sum, right? because I need to take the limit of the nth partial sum to see whether it converges. So I'm gonna just say, what is this? I'm gonna say, well, the nth partial sum is, well, the first would just be a, and then I get a r to the first power, and then a r to the second power, plus so on, plus a r to the nth power. That's gonna be, my nth partial sum, yeah. I say, okay, let's just multiply this guy by r. So I have r times sn, and that's going to give me a r to the first plus a r squared plus a, oops, a r cubed plus, plus a r to the n plus one, right? I'm going to add one power of r. Cool. Well, look at all of this stuff, well, except for that, is all up in here, right? There's actually an a r to the n right before that. Yeah, and then a r to the n plus 1. Because I multiplied that last term by an extra above. Okay. So all that stuff is all in here. I say, well, what if I subtract all that away? I should be able to simplify a bunch of stuff. So sn minus r s n. Well, let's see. I'm going to have a, the a r to the first, a r to the first, will sub subtract away. This will subtract away. The cubic will subtract away. a r to the n will subtract away. And I'll just have that. a r to the n plus 1. Very nice. That's looking like we've made some significant progress. Looks like I can factor out and Sn being 1 minus r, a plus a r to the n plus 1, divide over. Now I have this formula for S of n, a plus a r n plus 1 over 1 minus r. Cool. So there's my formula for the nth partial sum. I just started by writing it out like literally what it means, and now we've got a formula for it. I was looking for this so that I can take its limit, right? A limit as n goes to infinity. So let's look at over here. Well, there's nothing really that, can, that cares about n except for this piece. a and 1 minus r, this stuff's all constant stuff, right? It's this here that cares about n. Let's see, we already took care of the case, we thought about the case where r is equal to 1. That's already, we know that's going to diverge. It'll just be an infinite number of a's. So let's figure if r is greater than 1. Well, I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity. So if r is some number that's bigger than 1, it's going to be a mul multiplying by some massively huge power, right? This, this power is going to infinity. So it would be like 2 to the infinity power. Well, that's infinity. It's just going to blow up, right? 
So if r is greater than 1, it diverges. It's just going to blow up to infinity. This. Now what about if r is strictly less than 1? Well, then this piece is going to be some fraction, like a half or something, and it's going to be raised to a really, really big power. So it'll be like half of a half of a half of a half of a So it'll be super, 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 super small, right? This will go to zero. So this whole piece, if r is less than 1, strictly less than 1, then it'll converge. This just vanishes. It just goes to zero. And we get that it converges, not only that it converges, but that it converges to a over 1 minus r. Converges to a over 1 minus r. OK? So there's the proof. Now we'll get, we actually have in this that the absolute value of r needs to be less than 1. And we'll get that on the other side with the alternating series test in, in just a second. Okay, so we've, we've already got it on the positive side, right? Um, strictly speaking, this was um, greater than zero. Um, of course, it gets, I guess it could be greater than or equal to. If r is zero, well, then we're just adding zero, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. Of course, that converges, just zero. Good. All right. So that is a geometric series. Let's let's say uh, 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 let's try. I don't know. Let's drop a ball from I don't know ten feet. Um, drop a ball from ten feet high. And say it bounces, oh, I don't know. Let's not make our life too crazy. Um, let's say three quarters each time. OK? So we're going to drop this ball. It's got to bounce an infinite number of times before it comes to rest. But we'll see that it does so in a finite amount of time and it covers a finite amount of distance. This is a similar uh, resolution to Zeno's paradox, right? Where if you're going from here to the wall, I gotta go half the distance and then half the distance and then half the distance that I'm covering infinitely many halves and I'll never get there. Well, certainly you'll get there. It adds up to long. Um, but anyway, drop a ball from 10 feet high. So we start off 10 feet. And we're going to drop this ball, boom, and then it bounces three quarters, and then three quarters, and then three quarters, and then three quarters, and forever. Okay. So when we dropped it, this first one, that's 10 feet. Okay. Now it's going to go up and then down three quarters of 10 feet. So I've got two, actually, an up and a down, times the three quarters, which I got from here times the 10 feet. Okay, so that takes care of that distance. Now we're going to do it again, up and down, but this time it goes 3 quarters of the 3 quarters of 10. So this is 2, again, up and down, but now I've got 3 quarters squared times 10. That's 3 quarters of the 3 quarters. And here again, I'm going to get 3 quarters of 3 quarters of 3 quarters, so that's the cubic. 2, 3 quarters, Q, times 10, and so on forever, right? Forever. Okay, so let's look at what we've actually got here. Here I got a pattern. This is all the same stuff. This thing is like odd man out. So I'm just going to leave that to chill out front at 10. I don't need my units right now. Okay, so I'm going to just leave that to chill, and I'm going to deal with this. This is starting to look like something that I can sum up. So let's see. 
I've got 20. That's always the same in all of them. So I leave that at 20. And my common ratio is 3 quarters. So that looks like my R. 3 quarters to the N. But now i got to decide. Let's see. It doesn't look like I have a zero term here. I just, this is a first power, actually. And then first, second, third power. Okay, so I've got N starting at 1 and then going forever. Cool. But I need that n to be 0 in order to use my formula a over 1 minus r. So I'm going to fix that. I'm just going to shift the index and say, okay, no, never mind. I want to use my formula. So I'm going to use n equals 0 20 times 3 quarters to the n because this is a formula that I can use. But I got to say, oh, well, I've added a term. I've added a term where n is 0. So if n is 0, this thing is just 1, so I've actually added another 20, which means I need to subtract. I need to compensate for the fact that I added that extra 20 in here. So I've subtracted it away. Now we should be good to go. Now we can actually use the formula. This is minus 10. Then I have uh, plus a is 20 over 1 minus r is 3 quarters. That's a quarter times 4, negative 10, plus 80 gives me 70 feet. How beautiful is that? So even though that ball had to bounce an infinite number of times, it did so in finite time and covered 70 feet. So it covered a finite distance. Noise, and that's an apl application of geometric series. Again, we gotta worry about that index shifting. That index needs to be zero for geometrics. Okay, there's another type, a basic sort of type, that we encounter from time to time. This is particularly, you'll see this particularly when you're dealing with series involving rational functions where we can apply a parfrac. Because when we do that parfrac and split it, they often have opposite sign and things will start canceling out. So in this case, or these types of series are called telescoping. Telescoping series. Okay, and they're simply series where terms start to cancel out. And usually it's going to be, it'll leave you like the first term and one near the end. Or sometimes they'll all just cancel out after the first term and not even leave you an end term. Or very often it's usually something in front and something toward the end. Um, let me just address that otherwise by looking at a particular example. Let's say um, we look at the series n equal 1, uh, 1 over n minus... Um, 1 over n minus 1, n plus 1. Okay. So, again, I'm interested in taking the limit of the nth partial sum in order to determine its convergence, or what it converges to. So I need to determine what is the formula for the nth partial sum. I'm looking for s sub n. So I start by writing it out. I'll say, what is s sub n? Well, n is going to start at 1, so I've got 1 over 1 minus 1 over 1 plus 1 is 1 over 2. Okay, so that was it when n was equal to 1. Now n is going to be equal to 2, so I've got a half minus a third. So that was n equal 2. Then n equal 3, I get 1 third minus 1 over n plus, oops, 1 over 4, and then so on, and so on, and so on, up to 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. This is the nth partial sum. Okay, now let's look at it. Say, all right, this 1, it looks like nothing ever cancels it out. There's, there's It just hangs out there. So S of n is 1, okay, this guy, 
And now this minus a half is going to just cancel out with that plus a half. And likewise, this minus a third is just going to cancel out with that plus a third. And the minus a fourth, a plus a fourth, and so on and so on and so on. Now there'll be a minus one over n right here, which will cancel out with this one over n. And I'll be left with this guy hanging out at the end. A minus one over n plus one. I'll say, well, that's wicked easy to take the limit, right? I want to take the limit as n goes to infinity of this. This just goes to zero. So limit as n goes to infinity, s of n is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over n plus 1, which is just 1. Sweet. So there we go. This series does converge, and in fact, it converges to 1. Nice. So that's a telescoping series. As I said, very often this sort of thing will occur when you do a parfrac on a rational function. Nice. So we've talked about geometric, telescoping. Let's talk about P-series. But in order to do that, we also need the integral test. So let's talk about the integral test. <coughs> On the integral test, again, we're looking at a series, series n equal one to infinity of a sub n. And in order to use the integral test, I want there to be some function. So there exists some f of x. This f of x has to have, th there's three conditions that have to apply to it that we need to verify before we can use the integral test. First, continuous, continuous on the interval from one to infinity. All right, we're gonna look at that interval from one to infinity, so it needs to be continuous. That's the first thing. Second thing, it needs to be decreasing. Now, what's the easiest way to show that a function is decreasing? Well, show that its derivative is negative, right? If its derivative is less than zero, then it's a decreasing function. Okay, so continuous on the interval, decreasing, and the third thing, it needs to agree with the sequence at every natural number. In other words, f at n, oops, f at n, if we evaluate the function at some natural number, positive integer, that is a sub n, they agree, okay? If those three conditions are met, then the series n equals 1, a sub n, and the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx both converge or both, oops, sorry, it's both diverge. They have the same behavior, in other words. Okay? So we can look at this integral instead of looking at the series look at the integral's behavior and say, okay, I can make a conclusion about that series, which is discrete. This is continuous, so we can bring all our uh, integration rules and all those sorts of skills into, um, into play, okay? So they have the same behavior, either both converge or both diverge. Now, you may or may not have seen a construction like this before where one of your bounds is not an actual number. <laughs> in this case, our upper bound is gonna be infinity. So let me show you how to fix that, or how, to, how we deal with that. And it's sort of a, sort of a cheap trick, kind of. I, I don't know. It works, so it's not too cheap, but 
Um, if we have the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx, well, I certainly can't use my what is the second um, fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate this as an antiderivative because it, you can't evaluate a function at infinity. It's not a number, right? Well, what I can do is take a limit. So I'll take the limit as b goes to infinity. b is just going to be my upper bound dummy variable, a to b, f of x dx. Now, b is any finite number here. It's a finite upper bound. So I can do my integration just like normal, evaluate at b, and then take the limit as b goes to infinity. That's how I can fix the fact that that upper bound is bad. Okay, Just take the limit. Likewise, if my lower bound was negative infinity, I would take the limit as a goes to negative infinity uh, of f of x. Um, or maybe if it's a discontinuity, then I'll take the limit as a goes to the discontinuity instead of. But for us, we're gonna, our a is all basically always gonna be one, and the upper bound is always infinity, so that's kind of the important version of this. All right. So let's look at let's look at say the series n equal one uh, two to the uh, one over two to the n one over two to the n. All right. So really, I could restructure this and. This is already, without doing any work, this is, you know, this is still one to the n, right? So one half to the n. Aha, this is a geometric series where r is less than one. So clearly this converges based on that. And in fact, we can find out what it converges to. It converges to one, because you know? uh, we're missing that zero term, but still, Okay, we can get that this converges and what it converges to from the fact that that's a geometric sequence or a geometric series. But let's go back. Let's see. First thing I need to do is generate a, a, a function. Well, there's an obvious one. f of x equal to 1 over 2 to the x. Yeah? Clearly, what is f evaluated at a natural number? Well, 1 over 2 to that natural number, which is a sub f. All right, so it agrees at every natural number. That one's easy. It's continuous. We're not going to, it's differentiable on that interval, and it's continuous clearly. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's see, let's take the derivative. What's, um, this is, if f of x is, 2 to the negative n, well, let's see, we have the derivative that's ln of 2, 2 to the negative n times the derivative of negative n. What's the derivative of negative n? It's negative 1. Now, I don't need to go any further than this. I have that my derivative is negative. Yeah, it's less than 0. So, f prime, the derivative is less than zero. We got that it's negative. That implies that it's decreasing. All right. So it's continuous on our interval. It's decreasing, and it agrees at all the natural numbers. That means we can apply our integral test. So we want to look at the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the x dx. Well, first of all, we need to fix our bad bound. Let's see. We're going to take the limit as b goes to infinity the integral from 1 to b of 1 over 2x dx. All right, let's see. 
This is 2 to the negative x, right? Integral 1 to b dx. Limit as b goes to infinity. Uh, let's see. I, can I lose probably there? I think I need to do ln 2. 2 to the negative x. Is that what? When I integrate there, integrate um, a to the u, no, it's 1 over ln. Okay, so 1 over, oh no, wait, that's, oh, here I gotta, 